This is a video for our higher level C2.1 on chemical signaling, and we'll be taking a close look at signaling mechanisms. Fair warning, there's a lot of big words in this topic and in this section, um, and we're gonna go into a lot of detail on specific pathways. But I want you to keep your eye on the big picture here, which is that there are two major types of transduction pathways. Now, when I say transduction pathway, I mean just that sequence of interactions that gets kicked off by the binding of the ligand with the receptor. Okay, so ligand receptor binding, whatever happens after that is called a transduction pathway. And there are two main pathways. So we have the intracellular pathway, and that's when the ligand can enter the cell. It binds to a receptor that's inside of the cell, and that complex together, the ligand and the protein receptor, go into the nucleus and regulate genetic expression. So that's the intracellular pathway. Then we have the transmembrane pathway. Transmembrane pathways look like this, okay? They happen when we have a ligand that binds with a transmembrane protein, and that's because the ligand cannot enter the cell, okay? When that binding occurs, this a protein receptor is going to change shape. And that change of shape kicks off um, a secondary messenger molecule sequence, okay? So it produces secondary messenger molecules that then cause further changes within the cell. So we have two basic types here, depending on whether or not that ligand can or cannot enter the cell. So this one might be a little tough to imagine if you haven't already studied neural signaling, but I'll just give you a little bit of a hint here, um, which is that impulses that are passed along neurons really happen because sodium ions enter that cell. And the reason why that's important is because it changes the membrane potential. What do we mean by that? Well, potential has to do with charge. So our cells, our neurons especially, are normally negative on the inside when compared to the outside. And you can imagine how if a positive ion enters that cell, it's going to go from being negative to being positive. So a change in that membrane potential is really important for transmitting nerve signals. What does that have to do with neurotransmitters? Just hear me out. So neurotransmitters are things that are released by the presynaptic neuron. They travel through the synapse, that's that gap between neurons, and they bind to receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. This is going to cause sodium ion channels to open, okay, and whether or not they're opening here or here doesn't really matter. You'll learn more about that later, but at the end of the day, sodium ions get to enter the cell, it changes our membrane potential, and that's how nerve impulses are passed from one nerve to the other. We can also think about this um, in terms of nerve impulses being passed not only between nerves and other nerves, but between nerves and muscles. So acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that acts as a messenger molecule between neurons and motor units of muscles, or they're part of a motor unit. So they're passing to muscle fibers, okay? And they do the same thing. So when we have this binding here, and this is the important part, when we have a ligand, like a neurotransmitter, binding to one of those transmembrane receptors, it can kick off a series of other things, okay? So we just covered that, that these transmembrane receptors, when that ligand binds, it causes secondary messenger molecules to do other things in the cell. And whether that's opening up sodium ion channels or doing whatever it is that muscles do, um, it's just all a great example about what transmembrane receptors do when they bind with their ligand. So again, transmembrane receptors are for ligands that cannot enter the cell. They rely on other things happening um, to transmit that message. They can't go into the cell themselves. And here's a great example of a transmembrane protein. So I'm first gonna draw in the membrane. I'm not gonna draw all the phospholipids. I'm gonna assume <laughs> that you know that this is the membrane. So that's what this yellow line in. And a transmembrane protein is going to span both the outside and 
the inside of the membrane. And this is an example of a GPCR. And so what does that mean? That is a G protein coupled receptor. Whew, it's a transmembrane protein, and here's how it works. When GDP okay, is bound to this GPCR, it is inactive. It's just chilling out. It's not doing anything. It's just hanging out. However, when the ligand, and that's what this is here, this little pink dot, okay, when the ligand binds with this receptor, this GDP gets replaced by GTP, and this is going to cause a series of changes both within this protein and within this cell. So it causes this G uh, protein to disassemble and then act as a secondary messenger molecule, causing a further cascade of changes within the cell. Again, at the end of the day, this is all because the ligand cannot enter the cell and it's relying on other messenger molecules to go do its job inside of that cell. So let's put this into context and talk about it through the example of epinephrine. Um, I think you'll find that most of the time the IB is referring to this hormone as epinephrine, but some people refer to it as adrenaline. They will accept either one in your written answers usually, but you do need to be able to recognize this word epinephrine, so I just tend to use this one more often. This is a hormone that's produced by the adrenal glands. Those are glands that sit on top of your kidneys. And and epinephrine cannot enter the cell. So it's going to bind with the G protein. We just talked about those. Those are transmembrane proteins that sit right here in the membrane of the target cell. So when epinephrine binds, and I'll go ahead and circle that here, epinephrine is the, the ligand in this case. When it binds with the G protein, that again is going to cause a secondary messenger molecule cascade, okay? So this is going to cause the conversion of ATP into a molecule called CAMP, cyclic AMP. Again, that's a messenger molecule. And what this is going to do is it's going to amplify the effect even more. Please don't write this on your exam, but to think about what this means, this is like someone t knocking on someone's door and giving them a message. And then they get on the telephone and they call five people and they tell them about it. And then that person posts it on their Twitter. And then that post person gets on TikTok and they have a million followers. And you can understand how this message is getting amplified here exactly what we want to happen with the hormone adrenaline because adrenaline or epinephrine is there to help us with fight or flight. So it's there to get ready for some kind of like massive um, action. So one of the things that this might um, ask the cell to do is to convert glycogen into glucose. So hydrolyze glycogen into glucose so that we have lots of energy for our fight or our flight. And again, this is just all a mechanism for amplifying the effect of hormones within those target cells. So far, we've talked about transmembrane receptors in nerve cells that affect that membrane potential. We talked about G proteins. Now let's talk about a third type of transmembrane receptors, and these are the kinds that are associated with tyrosine kinase activity. So just in general, a kinase is a special type of enzyme. Ooh, look at that ending, A-S-E, that's enzyme. A special type of enzyme that is going to phosphorylate a molecule. And it's getting that phosphate group from an old friend, ATP. So it's going to pop off a phosphate group from ATP and stick it onto a molecule. Specifically, we'll talk about tyrosine kinase. Again, that's a special enzyme that does the same thing, but what is it sticking it to? It's sticking that phosphate group on tyrosine. That's a specific amino acid. So tyrosine kinase is going to take phosphate groups off of ATP and it's going to stick them onto tyrosine wherever that amino ha acid happens to fall within a polypeptide chain. This might be easier if we go through an example. Okay, so 
insulin is a great example of this particular type of transmembrane receptor. So this tyrosine kinase, this is the special enzyme that we've been mentioning, and it's right here. Okay, so it sits um, kind of like extended as these two little tails down into this transmembrane receptor. So here's this transmembrane receptor. It's got a part sticking out um, outside of the cell and then a part sticking into the cell. It goes all the way through the membrane. Here's the tyrosine kinase part. This happens to be a receptor for insulin. Insulin is a hormone and it cannot enter the cell. So before we get to specifics, what is the job of insulin? For some cells, the job of insulin is to open up glucose channels so that glucose can move from the blood plasma into the cell. It lowers blood glucose levels by getting those cells to take in that glucose. Well, cells can't take in that glucose unless they have glucose channels, right? Facilitated diffusion is specific for um, the type of molecule they work on. So insulin is going to bind to this receptor, and that is going to cause this tyrosine kinase to add a phosphate group to proteins. Now, that causes a conformational change in these proteins that are embedded in vesicles down here in the cell. When they change shape, what's gonna happen is that it's going to kick off a series of events that results in this vesicle fusing with the cell membrane, thereby embedding these little proteins in the membrane. And what are these little proteins? their glucose channels. So all of this is a way of getting glucose channels embedded within the membrane, and that's the role of insulin. It binds with the receptor, which causes changes inside the cell, which results in glucose channels being embedded within the membrane. And so all of that is happening without insulin actually ever being able to get into the cell to begin with. Pretty cool. Way back in the beginning of this video, we talked about two main transduction pathways. The one that involves transmembrane receptors because that signaling molecule cannot enter the cell. That's what we've just finished talking about. Now let's talk about that other type, the type that needs an intracellular receptor, and these are for signaling molecules that can enter the cell. So I specifically want to focus in on some hormones that happen to be hydrophobic. And ah, that's so great that they're hydrophobic because that means that they can enter the cell. They can get past this um, hydrophobic nonpolar phospholipid tail region. So that means that their receptor is going to be inside the cell. That's what intracellular means. And that hormone will enter the cell and bind with its receptor. From here, this hormone receptor complex is going to take a beeline. It's going to go straight to the nucleus and it is going to attach to the D and the DNA in the nucleus and it will literally change the pattern of genetic expression. This could mean that it promotes transcription, translation, and expression of genes. It could mean that it inhibits it. That can mean lots of different things, but it directly impacts genetic expression. This hormone goes into the nucleus itself attached to its receptor. So much different different than the transmembrane receptors where the signaling molecule is left outside of the cell. Now let's put this in context for two examples of hormones that can both um, cross the cell membrane and enter the cell. So we'll start with estradiol. Some people refer to this as estrogen. So if you see that and get confused, that's why, but I'm going to keep with this term estradiol for now. And this is in, um, I don't know, it works in conjunction with other hormones um, that come from the brain. So we're gonna kind of separate these pictures for now, and I'm going to focus on the brain for a second. Inside of the brain is a very important gland called the hypothalamus, and it's connected to another important endocrine gland called the pituitary gland. Now, the hypothalamus secretes a hormone that goes directly to the pituitary gland called gonadotropin-releasing hormone, GnRH. 
All right, that G in RH triggers the pituitary to release two of its own hormones called a luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. You will learn a lot about those hormones at another time. Just stick with me. It'll become clear why I'm mentioning them now. These, even though they're produced in the brain, travel through the bloodstream and act on a target tissue that is in the ovary. In the ovary, there are developing ova or eggs and surrounding those eggs are layers of cells called follicles. When they're acted upon by these pituitary hormones, they secrete, you guessed it, estradiol, okay? So that is where this hormone is coming from. Now, estradiol will travel to the cells of the hypothalamus, okay? It enters the cells of the hypothalamus, binds with a receptor, and goes directly into the nucleus of the hypothalamus cells. It causes even more transcription and translation to take place, which results in even more GnRH being produced, which results in even more pituitary hormones being produced, which results in even more follicular development and more estradiol and so on and so forth goes this cycle. Now, this is only one example. Um, it's a positive feedback loop. There are times when estradiol can act in a negative feedback loop with pituitary hormones, but the point of this here is, is understanding that even though these two organs are far apart, the brain and the ovary, okay, they're both connected by this hormone that is able to cross into the cell um, and directly affect the gene expression of cells in the brain. Now, not all ovarian hormones have target cells in the brain. Um, we'll go through an example one here that also comes from the ovary, but at a different time during the menstrual cycle. And this one is called progesterone. So progesterone is produced a little later on in the ovarian cycle, and it has a target cell or a target tissue um, right here in the endometrium. So the endometrium is this highly vascular lining here where the embryo would implant, okay, if that um, egg gets fertilized. And so it's really important that these cells be vascularized and have lots of nutrients and stuff. And so this progesterone will then travel via the bloodstream to these cells. It will enter the cells, okay, it's hydrophobic, it can go into those cells, it'll bind with a receptor, and it will um, regulate the genetic expression that um, thickens and uh, intensifies the nutrient value of this endometrial lining. So we'll end this video by summarizing the two major types of feedback mechanisms that can be used by cell signaling pathways, and those are positive and negative feedback loops. Negative feedback loops are really important for maintaining homeostasis. They make sure that values main, are maintained within a relatively narrow and stable range. So you can think of it as like if something increases in concentration a lot, there will be a set of steps that further, like it inhibits any further production. So it brings that concentration back down. And a great example here is testosterone. So testosterone is produced in the testes, which is nowhere near the brain, but I had to fit it on the screen. So use your imagination here. So much as we talked about before, okay, but now we're going to use um, a biological male, the hypothalamus secretes GnRH, gonadotropin releasing hormone, which causes the pituitary to release luteinizing hormone. Not FSH, not in males, okay, just the luteinizing hormone is fine. The luteinizing hormone then travels via the bloodstream to the testes, where it causes the release of testosterone. All right, testosterone um, is going to travel via the bloodstream and it's going to have effects on all types of target tissues. 
one of the target tissues just so happens to be here in the hypothalamus. So the testosterone, hmm, where am I going to fit this? The testosterone will travel to the hypothalamus and it will actually work to inhibit further gRNH production. So testosterone will enter that cell, the hypothalamus cell, it will bind with a receptor, it will go to the nucleus and it will affect gene expression in regards to turning it off. So it will turn off the gene for producing GnRH, which means it will also turn off the LH production, which means in turn that it will turn off testosterone production. So this is something that we want to do when testosterone levels are already high enough, and we wanna make sure that no more testosterone is produced. We wanna keep it within a certain range. When testosterone levels drop enough, then all of this inhibition will go away because the testosterone will go away. The, con the concentrations will be low enough to where there's nothing inhibiting this production anymore. GR GNRH will go back up, LH will go back up, testosterone will go back up, and we'll again engage in a cycle of negative feedback, okay? So all of that is an example of a negative feedback loop keeping values within a certain range. Now that's very different than a positive feedback loop in which that final product triggers even more production of the product, which makes even more product, which triggers even more production of the product, okay? So we get this like runaway cycle. And a great example here is in muscle cells. So in the membrane of a muscle cell, there exist um, receptors for chemical molecules that we don't need to know the specifics of, but what I do wanna show you is how that can trigger a positive feedback loop. So when this molecule, when this ligand binds with its receptor, what that does is it opens up calcium ion channels and calcium ions will move into the cell. That calcium ion moving into the cell triggers the next calcium ion uh, channel to open up, which means more calcium ions can enter into the cell, which is going to trigger the next calcium ion channel to open up, which triggers even more calcium ions to enter the cell. And so you can see how the final product um, creates a pathway for even more of that product to be produced. And so this is something that we'll find happening um, with hormones and calcium ions and lots of other types of chemical messaging molecules.